from D. James Kennedy Ministries. This is Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Happy Easter and welcome to Kennedy Classics. I'm Frank Wright, president of D. James Kennedy Ministries, where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. This Holy Week, if you are seeking a biblical perspective on the issues of the day, please explore our ministry website, djkm.org, where you can find a digital audio, video, and print collection for your walk of faith with Jesus Christ. In Dostoevsky's classic novel titled The Idiot, the central character is a young Russian prince with a penchant for making simple and straightforward observations. But in the jaded Russian society of the day, his seemingly naive but sincere comments lead some to mistake him for a simpleton. Yet profound and important ideas often turn on simple matters. In one passage, after observing someone die, the prince asks the most straightforward yet weighty question imaginable. Looking at the body of the deceased, he asks, where has he gone? This is, of course, the question of the ages. It was Job's question in the midst of his torment. If a man dies, shall he live again? At some point, this question tugs at the heart of every man, woman, and child, perhaps because, as the preacher in Ecclesiastes put it, God has placed eternity in our hearts. So what is the answer? If a man dies, shall he live again? It is the central question that Easter addresses. Here is Dr. D. James Kennedy with his message, Life After Death. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 11, we shall begin our reading with the 23rd verse. Lazarus, a dear friend of Christ's, who with his sisters Mary and Martha had often been hospitable to him and the disciples, now Jesus was gone away across Jordan because the Jews in Jerusalem were seeking to kill him. And he received the message, he whom thou lovest is ill. He waited day after day and did nothing. Finally, he said to his disciples, Lazarus is dead. And he rose up and headed for Bethany, which was just a stone's throw from Jerusalem. The disciples knew that this would mean their death. May we begin our reading as they approach the town of Bethany and are met by Martha. Jesus said to her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And may God speak to us today through his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. I am... I suppose what you would call dead. In fact, you would think that I have been dead for a very, very long time. Now, I find that very amusing. That some of you who walk in a death-like trance that you call life would suppose that I am dead. 
when the truth of the matter is, I am more alive than any of you or that I have ever been in all of my existence. I suppose that a word of introduction might be in order. My name is Simeon. Perhaps that rings a bell, perhaps not. It's a term that comes from a Hebrew word, shimon, which means to hear. In fact, I was named after a prayer. Which of you could say that? The great Shema, which means to hear. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord Jehovah is our God. The Lord Jehovah is one. To hear. I suppose that maybe my father thought that perhaps I would be more inclined to listen. Unfortunately, I haven't lived up to my name. I am much more want to talk than to listen. I usually go by the shorter version of it, not Simeon, but just Simon. You may recognize me better. You call me the big fisherman, and that I was, because you see, I came from Bethsaida, which means the house of fish. There on the shores of Lake Galilee, the house of fish, and it was almost inevitable that my father and my younger brother Andrew and I would earn our living as fishermen. And it was some time later when, lo, this man walked up to where we were working on the nets with our father and said, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. That was the most astonishing thing that anyone had ever said to me. Follow him? But something seemed to take hold of my heart, and I could not but get out of the boat and follow him. And I began that day an adventure, an odyssey of the strangest things that you could ever imagine. I saw unbelievable things. I saw blind eyes opened. I saw the deaf hear. I saw the la lame rise and run. I saw people that were lepers touched and healed. I saw this man walk on the water of the lake. I saw all of those things, and I was astonished beyond measure. One day he said to me, when we were far in the north, he said to all of us, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And someone said, Some say that thou art Elijah, and some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to us, And who say ye that I am? Well, blustery person that I was, I had to jump up and answer the question. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the God, the living one. How did I know that? Where did that come from? Jesus says, Thou hast not said this of thyself, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed it unto you. And then the greatest adventure that we had when a messenger came with a note for Jesus saying, He whom thou lovest is ill. He knew it was from Mary and Martha, and he knew that it referred to Lazarus. But the evening came, and the night passed, and again another day and another, and finally Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is now dead. Let us go unto him. When we got close to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, Martha, one of the two sisters, came out. She said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And he said, Your brother shall rise again. And she said, 
I know that he will rise at the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. An astonishing claim. And he said, where have you laid him? And so they arose and went to the tomb. It was in the side of a hill, and it was covered with a great stone. And Jesus said to the servants, Take ye away the stone. Jesus prayed to his Father. Then he lifted up his eyes toward the tomb, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And when he stepped out of the grave, the word went around the multitude that was watching. He's alive. He's alive. Lazarus is alive. And of course, the night came not too long hence when Jesus, after the Lord's Supper, had taken them out to the Garden of Gethsemane outside the city wall of Jerusalem. And there he had prayed for three hours. And he had prayed the same thing. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. This cup which contained the distillation of the sin of all of the men and women who have ever lived on this earth. And Jesus recoiled from that as we would recoil from death itself. Finally, we saw a multitude. At a great distance, they looked like fireflies, but as they drew closer, we could see there was a band of soldiers and officers of the temple and the Roman guard. And they had torches, and they had spears, and they had swords, and they were coming out to get him. For Judas had betrayed him. And when they arrived, Jesus stepped forward to meet them, unafraid. And he said to them, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he took another step forward and said, I am. The tetragrammaton in Hebrew, the four-letter word, the, in, the ineffable name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah. And when he said that word, suddenly they went backward and fell on the ground. When at length they managed to get to their feet again, he said, I said unto you that I am he. If you seek me, then let these go. And like a bunch of scared mice, we scurried off into the trees, running as fast as I could and the rest as well. When finally out of danger's reach, I stopped my run with grabbing a tree and turned around and saw to my side there was John. And we watched the fireflies descend back down the hill into the gate and into the city. We knew we just could not, we couldn't do this. We couldn't just abandon him. And so we determined to follow him. Now John was very well connected in his family and knew the high priest. And so therefore when he got to the gate, the maiden let him in and he came out and got me. And we both went in and waited by a brazier of coals that had been lighted so that we could gain warmth on that cold night. Inside, Jesus was being interrogated by the high priest, by, by Caiaphas. Caiaphas, that togated hypocrite who bears my name. You see, Caiaphas and Cephas are the same word, different form, both meaning a stone. Now, inside, Caiaphas was grinding Christ with his questions, determined to get him to admit his guilt. Outside, I, another stone, yet still nothing more than sifting sand, was denying him. Three different times they came and said, Thou also art one of him. Thy speech betrayeth me. And I began to curse saying, you want to hear some speech? 
This ought to convince you I have nothing to do with Jesus. And by the way, some of your speech convinces others of the same thing. So I began to curse, saying I never knew the man. And in the midst of this outrage of cursing and shouting and denial, suddenly everyone got quiet as they led Jesus out of one room across a balcony to a next. And hearing my voice, he turned and looked down right into my eyes. I felt a shock going right to my heart. And I said, he heard me. He heard what I said. He heard the denials. He heard the profanity. He heard the blasphemy. He heard it all. And in that quiet moment, suddenly, from outside the wall, the sound of a cock crowing. Before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice, said the omniscient one. So I did. Realizing what I had done, my eyes filled with tears, and I burst my way through the crowd, pushing people right and left, and made my way out the gate and out of the city and out back into the woods. Finally, I fell on my face and wept as I had never wept before. I thought my heart would break. How could I have done this? I have denied him. I have cursed and said I didn't believe him or know anything about him. Oh, Peter, what have I done, you? You sifting, shifting sand. All that night. And the next day and nights were just the same. There was no sun in the sky. It had gone out for me. My life had no meaning, no joy, no purpose, no hope. It was all over. But then on Sunday morning, having gotten close enough to Calvary to see his crucifixion, realizing that I had some part in that, in denying him. My heart was even yet more sore. And when he finally died, life was over for me. And several days later, I was in my room I couldn't sleep that night, and I was pacing back and forth. I was like a caged lion, pacing back and forth from one side of the small room to another. And suddenly, when I turned, there he was, standing right in front of me. I blinked my eyes, thinking this must be an apparition, a spirit. This cannot be real. But as I looked at the nail prints in his hands and feet, I realized it was Jesus and he said to me, Peter, and I fell on my knees and wept. I cried out to him saying, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I can't believe that I did that. Please have mercy upon me. Forgive me, O oh Lord. He reached out his hand. Well, there are some things in life are too personal, too intimate to be talked up publicly. You can read of this event in the Corinthian letter of our beloved brother Paul, but you will have to simply take my word that it happened. He did indeed appear unto Cephas. And my heart was changed. I felt that all of that sifting sand within me had been fused into a stone and the fear of death was gone. That night, I went to our custom meeting place, and the other disciples were there, and I told them that I had seen the Lord. They didn't believe me. And then two came that had been on the Emmaus Road and said that they had seen the Lord, and they didn't believe them either. And suddenly, in the midst of that conversation, it got quiet, and I turned behind me, and there again was Jesus. Everyone froze. They panicked. They were filled with terror and fear. I 
was the only one in the room that was not afraid. All fear was gone. The fear of death had been taken away, and with it all lesser fears. And I was indeed a rock. It was but a few weeks later at Pentecost that there I stood in the temple where there were thousands of people gathered around and I preached a great sermon about Christ, the great Redeemer, this one who had been foreordained by God, who had been crucified by the rulers, but God had raised him from the dead and made him Lord and Christ. So powerful was that message that 3,000 of them, having said, what can we do? I told them to repent and be baptized in the name of Christ. And so the church took off in a tremendous way. However, the high priests again heard about what I was doing, and they sent soldiers to take me and bring me to them. And I found myself, to my amazement, standing before that group that I feared more than any other group of men in this world. And there was Caiaphas, the condemning priest and the denying apostle, the upper and the nether millstones there in Caiaphas's hall of justice had ground the bread of life, the great good kernel into the bread of life. And now I was next. Was I afraid? No. I said to them, the stone which you, the builders, rejected has become the head of the corner, and neither is there salvation in any other name. For there is no other name by which we may be saved except Jesus. They were stunned. They could not believe their ears that I, an unlettered fisherman, had had the boldness to stand before the great Sanhedrin and declare to them that they could not be saved except through this one whom they had crucified. They took note of me that I had been with Jesus. Do men take note of you that you have been with Jesus when they see your boldness, your openness to witness to Christ? Or they, do they see a vacillating, fear-filled person, afraid even to, pers- to approach another simple individual in this life? What would you do before the Sanhedrin? Ah, dear one, if your heart is still filled with fear when you contemplate death, if you are still living on the dark side of Easter, I would tell you that death has been conquered, the grave has been opened, and Christ has triumphed over the king of terrors. And those that trust in him have discovered that death no longer holds any terror for them, for they will simply step out of this body and into paradise. Do you have that assurance? Do you know beyond any peradventure that you will be with him forever? If you don't know that, you can. You must know it. On, and on this resurrection morning, there could not be a better time to discover and receive it. He that believeth on me shall never die. Believest thou this? How foolish I had been. I said, when Jesus said, whither I go, you cannot come now. I said, Lord, whither is it that I cannot come now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. How foolish I didn't know that he came from heaven to lay down his life 
for my sake, and that if I would receive him, I would live forever. That is the message of Easter. Is it the glad tidings of your heart? It can be, even right now. May we pray. Father, there are some here that have never met thy Son. And we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that thou who are right here in our midst desire to change, to forgive, to bless, to cleanse, to renew lives that are gathered here. Some are still living in the darkness of the shadow of death. Deliver them, we pray right now. Draw unto thyself such as should be saved that they may find the wonder of your love, the blessing of your forgiveness, the gift of everlasting life, saying, come, Lord Jesus Christ, come right now into my heart and change my life forevermore. Amen. Did you ask Christ to come into your heart and change you as Dr. Kennedy prayed just now? If so, welcome to the family of God. And how wonderful to have your spiritual birthday at Easter. To help you begin your new life in Christ, we have a special gift for you. It's called Beginning Again, which is precisely what you're doing. To receive your copy, just write to our address or call our toll-free number and be sure to ask for Beginning Again. God bless you and Happy Easter. What a glorious conclusion to the retelling of the Easter story from the Apostle Peter's perspective. Here was a simple fisherman who denied Jesus three times and yet after the resurrection was filled with the Holy Spirit to boldly proclaim the gospel all the way to Rome. We pray that you have also been emboldened by the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. Would you like a copy of Dr. Kennedy's Easter message, Life After Death, to have for yourself or to encourage someone who also needs to hear it? We'll send it to you as our thanks for your generous gift to help broadcast unique messages like this one. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11164, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll free 888-332-3069. Or go online to djkm.org. And please include a generous gift toward the ongoing work of this ministry. I'm Frank Wright. Happy Easter to you and yours. We'll see you next time on Kennedy Classics. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.